Hello and welcome to this How to Overcome Lower Back Pain Q&A. Uh, these are questions that I've got through a variety of my social media platforms. Um, I regularly get them and sometimes it's useful to sort of consolidate them and put them into a video like this uh, to be able to share with you guys so you can um, uh, sort of upgrade your knowledge on the topic of lower back pain. Some of the questions I have today are a little bit about me, um, which, uh, well, I suppose I'll go through them. I've got six questions all together. Number one uh, is about me, which is what are your qualifications? So in some respects, why am I talking about this? What gives me the, um, the reason to be able to talk about this topic? Uh, number two, another one similar. What are your experiences? Uh, what experiences do you have with working with people with lower back pain? Um, number three is why do you talk so much? Number four is does McGill not advise against the Palov press, which is a certain exercise? Um, number five is have you ever seen someone reduce their lower back pain by strengthening their back? Number six, what's your best advice for overcoming lower back pain? If you want to go to any of those uh, specific questions, go to the description below uh, and their timestamps. You can go through, you can uh, listen to those questions or answers specifically. Um, but if you want to watch the whole thing all the way through, then hopefully th it will give you the, uh, the sort of the knowledge uh, to be able to, to answer some of those questions for yourself. And you may even pick some principles up um, that you've been uh, that you've been thinking about and this education or this knowledge helps you confirm what you've been thinking uh, already. Either way, um, education is the most important part of this video. So we'll get straight into uh, question number one, which is what are your qualifications? Now, by uh, certainly in the UK, to work in the health and fitness industry, you need what's called a vocational qualification. So you need a qualification that allows you to work within the industry. So I have two of those. So I have a personal trainer's qualification and I have a sports massage therapy qualification. So that allows me to work with people rehabilitating after an injury and then personal training allows me to work with people in some respects after that when they're working on their fitness. Now what I've also been able to do is work or uh, complete a qualification which is the personal training level four which is a specialism in lower back pain or exercise for lower back pain. So what that allows me to do is I can work with someone with a bad back using sports massage therapy. I can then, once the um, lower back pain is reduced, I can then cross that bridge of rehabilitating using exercise and uh, getting them back to a point where they can go into their fitness, where I can use the personal training qualification. So what you can hopefully see is there's a little bit of a, a method to the qualifications that I've done and the reason that I've done them. What I've also done are um, BackFit Pro or Dr. Stuart McGill. He's got um, his three levels uh, of qualifications that he does. He has his level one, which is a foundation in lower back pain. He's also got his assessment or assessing of lower back pain, which is his level two. And then his level three, which is like a fitness and performance um, uh, content. So again, he's looking at that journey as well. Now, again, what I've been able to add to that is, or add to my qualifications, is that which gives me that specialist knowledge in being able to assess someone's lower back, being able to, in some respects, help them uh, reduce their lower back pain and then rebuild their fitness uh, without the lower back pain in the background sort of thing. Um, so those are the three levels of McGill that I've completed, foundation, assessment and performance. Then, uh, to add to that, I've gone through Grey Cooks or uh, Functional Movement Systems FMS, Level 1 and Level 2, which is again another assessment in assessing how people move. If you see restrictions or if you see, uh, let's just say, improper movement, um, the Level 2 is then what exercises you choose, what stretches you choose, how do you put them together, what, what sort of uh, combination do you use, so on and so forth. So it's it's building that knowledge around being able to assess someone, understand the problem, and then fit the right solution together um, to be able to then get them out of the problem that they're in and then solve it and then get them back into the fitness as well. So all of those, quali or most of those qualifications, the sports massage therapy, the exercise for lower back pain, the McGill method, and the FMS is all about 
being able to assess someone who's coming to you in some respects with a problem and then you're able to get them out of that problem which then leads us into the personal training which is then rebuilding that fitness uh, to be able to uh, to get them back fitter than uh, in some respects than they have been before and what I've also been able to add to that is uh, UK's UK strength and conditioning um, foundation course their weightlifting course and their planning and programming course which again is another sort of uh, fitness based um, uh, qualification which is doesn't really take into consideration um, injuries it's just simple you're it, it's assuming that you're getting the client fresh and they're able to go into the workouts that you want them to do so um, to, to sort of in some respects summarize uh, the qualifications that I have it's sports massage therapy and personal training they're the two vocational qualifications they allow me to work in the health and fitness industry what I've then been able to do is wrap around that the uh, the McGill method or learning the McGill method through his level uh, one two and three workshop foundation assessing and performance um, I've also got FMS level one and FMS level two, which is assessing movement and then being able to choose the right exercises for that. Uh, and oh, I've also the exercise for lower back pain um, specialist course and the UK strength and conditioning foundation um, uh, weightlifting program, uh, weightlifting workshop and uh, the programming workshop, which again helps me then work with people um, when they're in some respects injury free and able to do fitness training if that makes sense so that is my uh, those are my qualifications and that is the type of people that I work with so which sort of in some respects leads neatly on to question number two which is what experiences do you have working with people with lower back pain well this goes all the way back to the very start uh, when I first qualified in 2008 I would get people come to me they would want to get fitter and they would say, I've got a bad back, I've got a bad knee, I've got a bad shoulder, something like that would come up. So I had to upskill very quickly to be able to work with these types of people. Because again, what uh, a lot of qualifications do is they assume the person is fit and ready to go. So when you get someone who comes in with a bad back, a bad knee, whatever, if you've just got a simple personal training qualification, it's not going to cut it because you haven't been trained in that. So I had to upscale uh, very quickly um, with regards to that and to be able to work with those people properly. Um, so with regards to that, I've been working since 2008 with people with bad backs in one uh, form or another. Um, normally it would be people would come to me for a f with a fitness goal, but they would have lower back pain. What happens now is people come to me with a lower back pain and they want to get out of it. Some people want to go into fitness and want to continue that journey. Some people just want to get out of pain. They aren't necessarily interested in being fit. They're not interested in having fitness goals. They just have a back pain and they want to get out of it. So if we look at some of the more, uh, let's just say serious um, sort of back injuries that I've worked with, uh, people with disc bulges, people with disc herniations, um, people that have, uh, I've been diagnosed with stenosis, sciatica, um, uh, what was uh, spondylolisthesis was the other one. So most of the major back problems, I've seen it in some way, shape or form. Um, another one are uh, sort of uh, osteoarthritis of the spine. Um, that's another one. Uh, working with a guy with that um, at the moment, uh, working with another lady with, again, sciatica at the moment. So I've always got people coming through with um, with back problems. Back spasms is another one, but back spasms are generally um, there for some other reason because it's the body protecting itself. Um, with regards to how long um, I'm working with them for, uh, one lady... I worked with for about six months that was using um, the McGill method so uh, the McGill level one two and three course um, that gives you the the principles of the McGill method what you've all if you've watched many of my videos before you'll see I've got if I can point to it that's uh, Dr McGill's main book low back disorder I've then got his other three books next to it 
Um, I've interviewed him three times, so I have a, a, a relatively good grasp of the principles that he's teaching. Um, so I've, uh, when I work with people with lower back pain, those are the principles that I'm using. So I use his McGill method to be able to assess the lower back, to be able to start building a picture of what the problem is, so I can then start using in some respects, my method, my what I would describe as like my Christopher Hall training method, um, which is the selecting of the right exercises, stretches, everyday activities, um, and, and ways to build, rebuild that spine or reduce the lower back pain and rebuild the spine health. Um, so this lady came to me. Uh, this was, uh, she'd had a very severe back spasm. Um, the, there was probably an under, she never had a, an MRI scan, but the underlying problem, based on the assessments that I was able to do with her from the McGill method, um, was pointing towards a disc bulge. Disc, it was probably a disc bulge, not a disc herniation, um, but it could be disc bulge, disc herniation. Um, so we knew that was kind of the problem. So what we were able to do was, um, and how, and, and there are certain assessments that point you in that direction. So I'm not just saying that that's what I think the problem was there are certain tests that I can do with people that point in that direction. So it's not just me sort of plucking ideas out of the, out of the sky. When you perform the test, if it, if it comes back negative or if it comes back positive, it points you in a certain direction at a certain condition of the lower spine. So that's why I can, I can say that. And that's what the McGill method um, helps with. It helps point you in that direction to sort of pinpoint a, uh, a problem within the lower back. Um, so she came to me um, and she had that severe back spasm. What we were then able to do is get her out of that back pain and then uh, sort of get her back to doing the classes at the gym that she wanted to do and the running that she wanted to do. So I worked with her for about six months to get her to a point where she felt confident enough that she could start going back exercising on her own. And that's where those qualifications came into their own because I was able to work with her. I had the, um, the, the, the skills to be able to get her out of lower back pain because of the McGill method, because of the exercise for lower back pain specialist course, um, because of these, these books here, and the sports massage therapy as well. So all of those combined, I was able to put together to be able to get her out of her lower back pain. What I was then able to do is use the uh, the personal training, the UK strength and conditioning qualifications to then rebuild her back to the previous fitness level that she had before and to give her the confidence and the education that she needed to be able to go back to the gym and do the exercises that she wanted to do un supervised if that makes sense but she felt confident enough to go and do it that she wouldn't then go about her hurting herself again and in some respects that is my ultimate goal for everyone that I work with I want them to be able to be confident enough to know in some respects why their lower back pain happened and what they need to, to do to be able to minimize the risk of that happening again and that's what those qualifications are allowing me to do um, another gentleman that I worked with um, this was online. The previous one, I worked with her face to face. This one was online. I worked with him for about, I think it was eight to 10 weeks um, online. Um, again, we went through the McGill method. Uh, I'm, I've, because I have all that online, I'm able to take people through it remotely. So I take them through it remotely. It's all online. You just go through the consultation, the, uh, the assessments, all online. Then we were able to work together. He feeds back all that information to me and then I'm able to piece together and put together the correct program that's specific to his lower back pain. So his problem was um, he was in pain literally as soon as he stood up. After about 30 seconds, he would be in pain. What we were then able to do over the period of 10 weeks is basically take him from standing up and being in pain within 30 seconds to being able to walk for 40 minutes without any pain whatsoever he was he, he told me he was cleaning his bathroom he was um he was walking around a local um lock he was from scotland um without any pain and he was able to go back to work without the pain that he was experiencing and that was again down to understanding the person's lower back pain understanding the mechanisms understanding not only the mechanisms that keep him painful but the ones that keep him pain free and then implementing the ones that keep him pain free and removing the ones that keep him painful. 
So there are a couple of examples. I've had many, many different examples from very mild lower back pain to full-blown lower back pain, as I've described a couple of times. Um, sciatica is another one I think I've mentioned. Uh, I've had quite a few people on that. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a, a couple of examples. I could go on, but I think that's enough for now. Um, question number three is why do you talk too much? Now, I wanted to address this question. It's a question that I've had over the years that I've been doing these videos um, because what most people are looking for is, oh, just give me an exercise. So many of the questions that I get is, what's the best exercise? What exercise can I do for this? What exercise is good for that? So on and so forth. And if you're asking for an exercise for lower back pain, then you're missing two steps prior to that. You're not understanding your lower back pain and you're not necessarily reducing your lower back pain. So what most people are doing, and this is again something within the industry that a lot of people aren't getting from other professionals. They're just getting them a basic assessment and then it's, right, build your core up. Here's a plank, here's a side plank, here's some crunches, here's this exercise, here's that exercise, or go and do yoga and your back pain will get better. It doesn't get better then they eventually get to me and say oh I've been to see this person that person and the other person and none of it worked I'm then able to go right let's understand your lower back pain and let's get you on the right track and pain free so why do I talk so much it's to help people learn that that exercise isn't going to solve your problem of lower back pain Having a stronger core isn't going to solve the problem of lower back pain. You've got to understand the lower back pain. I've seen many people that have a strong core and they have lower back pain. They don't need a stronger core. They need to reduce their lower back pain, which is a problem with the spine and a stronger core doesn't resolve the problem that's happening at the level of the spine. So I'm talking so much is because I want to educate people and help them understand that there is a difference between just giving someone an exercise and overcoming their lower back pain. Because you've got to, over to overcome lower back pain, you've got to understand the person's lower back pain first. You've then got to understand the mechanisms that create it and understand the mechanisms that, in some respects, alleviate it. And then you've got to build your rehabilitation around those two mechanisms at a very fundamental level. There's a bit more to it than that, but at its most fundamental, that's the kind of direction that we're that we're putting people in. So when I'm talking about exercises for lower back pain, um, we first got to understand what exercises to choose. If we can understand what exercises to choose, now there are common ones that I use, but again, the ratio at which we use them, which one we start using, that depends on the person's lower back pain. But if you wanted four exercises that are good for people that have lower back pain that I use with most people, it will be a plank, a side plank, a bridge, and a bird dog. Those are the four most common exercises that I begin people with when they're overcoming lower back pain. But what we've got to do before we get there is we've got to first of all understand it so we can understand which ones to use and when and how often and how much and then we've got to start reducing the lower back pain which might not need exercises yet and then we can start getting the exercises in so again all those qualifications build through that system of understanding reducing and then in a sense applying the exercises to it um, so again the reason I talk so much is because I want people to learn this and it's educating people around that in the fact that yeah lower back pain is a little bit more than just throwing a few exercises and throwing a few stretches at it or going and doing yoga because that's not treating the cause of the problem that's just trying to either make the hips looser or the core stronger sort of thing so if we now go on to um, question number four Now, question number four, does McGill not advise against the Palov press? So another useful exercise to help people overcome lower back pain can be the Palov press. Now the Palov press is where, if I was to stand side on to a um, cable machine, so I've got a cable machine there and I've got a handle in my hand, 
I bring it across my chest and I push it away and I bring it back. That's known as the Paloff press. Now, if someone has a back pain that is triggered by a lateral shear, now what a lateral shear is, if you can imagine, that's a vertebra, that's a vertebra, and then there's a disc in between. This is the front and this is the back. If the force and what triggers their lower back pain is that sideways force, which is known as a shear force, a lateral shear force, then a Palov press isn't going to be useful for that individual. For the very simple reason is that a Palov press creates that lateral shear force. It doesn't mean that the vertebra move on top of each other like that, but it creates that force that triggers their lower back pain. Because the first part of the McGill method is to understand the triggers. If you understand the triggers and you understand that lateral shear is a problem for someone, then you don't select the exercises that trigger the pain because you're then just essentially giving them lower back pain through the exercises that you're giving them. It's the same with um, if someone's got a flexion intolerant back and that creates their pain. So if someone's sat with a flex spine like that and it's creating their pain, they shouldn't be going into postures, positions or movements that flex the spine. Again, if it's extension, so when you uh, start yoga, there's a lot of extension poses. There's even a lot of flexion poses. So if you have someone that has flexion intolerance in their spine and that creates pain, or if they have extension intolerance where they're extending backwards, then you don't want to select exercises that, uh, that in a sense, repeat that mechanism because, you're again, you're creating the pain through the exercise that they're doing. Now, with the McGill method, I'm able to assess that and understand that, and then once I understand that, I can then start selecting the, the right postures, positions, movements, loads, exercises, stretches to be able to keep them pain free and I don't trigger it. So it's not just a case of a blanket statement saying the Paloff press is great for lower back pain or the Paloff press, you should never do it for lower back pain. It depends on the individual's lower back pain, which is why I always say your lower back pain is specific to you because one person will have a lateral shear trigger, whereas another person will have a flexion intolerance trigger and another person will have a compression um, trigger, so on and so forth. All of this points at a certain um, solution. And if we can find all the triggers, we can eliminate them and we can then start putting in place all the things that keep them pain free. And then we're starting to build a rehabilitation for overcoming lower back pain. And then we just carry that through all the way into fitness training if that's the place where someone wants to take it. And that's another reason for the qualifications is when I work with someone through that whole journey, I understand all the history all the way through. Because what happens sometimes is if someone comes to see me as a trainer and then they go and see another physio or they go and see another chiropractor or osteo, is I might have the initial history but when they go and see someone else, they don't understand that history. They don't ask about that history. They then start giving them stuff. They come back to me with all these extra exercises and I'm like, well, this doesn't make any sense because of what we understood previous. So it gives me that ability to be able to work through that whole journey, to be able to know the history, to know how they respond to exercises, stretches, movements, postures, positions, and then we can then build through that to get them out of pain. Um, so to answer the question, which I kind of done already, is does McGill not advise against the Palov press? He does and he doesn't. It depends on the person's pain and how it's triggered. If it's triggered by the Palov press or the mechanisms that it creates, don't do it. Choose other exercises. If it isn't, then obviously start cautiously, start sensibly, and you can build them up and use that as an exercise. Question number five. Now there's a little bit more to this one. So have you ever seen someone reduce lower back pain by strengthening their back? I've, dedicated, I've been dedicated to glute strengthening and core stability slash endurance, in brackets, McGill Big Three. But although I feel really stable, I have no reduction in pain. Now, I've kind of answered this question already. 
in so much as you can't throw exercises at lower back pain. That bit comes once we've understood the mechanisms. Because if you aren't taking the mechanisms away with everyday life, with uh, exercises and stretches, then you're not going to get a reduction in pain. This is the biggest misconception about lower back pain that I know of in the industry, is the fact that people have got it in their heads that if they have a stronger core or if they just do a bunch of exercises, their back's going to get better and be pain free. And it's the biggest misconception that I come across. And I have to educate people in, we've got to understand your lower back pain. We've, got, we've potentially got to modify postures, modify positions, modify movements to be able to reduce the pain. Once we can then reduce the pain, we start unpicking the lower back pain. And once we start unpicking it, we can start replacing the pain with stability, endurance, strength, around the lower back, around the hips and around the core. But we can only do that once we've started reducing the pain because if the pain's still there, you're building strength or endurance or stability on a, um, on a crumbling foundation that will eventually end up in pain again. So we have to understand that first. So have I ever seen someone reduce lower back pain by strengthening their back? No, that comes next. I've seen people overcome their lower back pain by understanding their lower back pain, removing the triggers, and then starting to build and modify postures, positions, movements, and loads that keep them pain-free, and then choosing the right exercises at the right time for that specific person and their specific lower back pain, and that's what builds their rehabilitation. But it all starts with understanding their lower back pain. That's the foundation to everything. Because if you get that, it sets the stage and helps you choose all the rest of it. So you can, you can look up exercises, they will have some benefit, but it won't have the effect of understanding lower back pain, which is exactly what I do in my online course, where you can learn it for yourself online, remotely, you can do it through my online coaching where I help you work through the online course piece by piece or face to face if you're local, you can come to see me in the gym and again, I will work with you and work you through the online course because essentially the online course is what you do in between the sessions. I My advice and recommendations are based on what's in there. I'm just choosing what you need to do based on what I know about your lower back pain. So I will say, go and go to that workshop first and make sure you're focused on learning this bit, that bit, and that bit. Come back to me next week and we'll, if you've started to apply it, if you've got any questions, we'll review that, answer those questions, and then set you on to the next one. So it's very much understand the lower back pain, know how to reduce it, or know how to start reducing it, know how to um, start being pain free, when we come back for the next session, it's review how are you getting on with those advice and recommendations. Right, let's move you on to the next bit, so on and so forth. And that's how the coaching works. Excuse my camera, um, it just randomly stopped automatically. Um, so I will. I don't think I missed a great deal off that answer, but basically um, what I'm trying to say is, have I ever seen someone reduce uh, lower back pain by strengthening their back is no. We have to understand it first and then um, uh, we can then start building our rehabilitation for that. Um, the final question, question six, is what's your best advice for overcoming lower back pain? Well, there are essentially three, uh, three bits of advice that I give people. Number one is using your better judgment. Number two is being cautious. And number three is progressing at the right time or knowing that you've got to do something uncomfortable at some point. So it's going to, um, uh, it's, you're going to potentially be a slightly anxious about doing it, nervous about doing it, but there's gonna be a point where that has to happen. Now, what I mean by using better judgment is, be it face-to-face -face or online, doesn't matter. A lot of professionals think you can only treat lower back pain face-to-face. 
this isn't the case. I've proven that. I've worked with people online. We've helped their lower back pain or I've helped their lower back pain. The key is the person learning about their lower back pain and using their better judgment and being honest with me because sometimes I might be thinking, right, okay, we need to do this. They'll try that out and go, oh, that doesn't feel quite right. Now, I need that feedback because I've got the ex past experiences of things like that happening in the past. But one thing I do know is that their lower back pain is specific to them. So what works for one person doesn't mean it's going to work for the next person. But from the experience that I have, there's a good probability. But some people it doesn't. So I need that feedback to be able to go, okay, that's not working for you, right? We need to try it this way, or we need to simplify it, or we need to make that easier. So it's not necessarily that the movement, the posture, the position, or the exercise is wrong. We might be doing it at a, the wrong intensity, or it might be slightly too complicated or too hard for them, so we need to modify it. So I need them to use their better judgment. So when they go away from either a face-to-face -face session or an online session and start practicing this online, when they ask me, oh, should I be doing it this way or should I be doing it that way? I need to be able to say, well, if you try it that way and it doesn't work, you need to use your better judgment to be able to say, right, I need to try it. I need, I need to do it this way. So in some respects, only they can make that decision. I can't make that decision for them because I can't feel their lower back pain. I can't feel it aggravating their lower back pain. So if they don't feel comfortable doing the exercise, they need to use their better judgment to use the easier version or the modified version of that exercise or movement or posture or position or whatever it is that we're working towards. So that's using the better judgment. Now again, as I mentioned, that can be done online or it can be done face to face. There will be professionals out there that will be stonewall, just blanket and say, no, you can't do it online. You can, I've done it, so it can be done. Um, but it all, the, because the same process happens face to face. I give them stuff to do, but I need to educate them to be able to use the modified versions of it. Because whether it be online or face to face, when they're at home, it doesn't matter if they come and see me face to face or online because they're at home. They need to have that better judgment to be able to overcome their lower back pain. The second one, which is being cautious. So it's, if we're, if we're having progress, we're not moving too fast. So if they're not feeling pain in the moment of doing the movement or the posture or the position or the exercise, that doesn't mean that it's not causing a problem because we might experience that a day later or two days later. Now again, that's useful feedback. Now, if I've got someone that, and I, I would always say to someone, we need to see how your body responds to everything that it's doing. So if in the day after, or the 24 hours after, or 48 hours after, they're saying, should I be doing this tomorrow or the next day? I need to say, you need to use your better judgment to be able to see, because I'm not there, because it's the next day, whether that's the right thing to do. Because I don't know, if their body responds fine to it, they can do it. If their body um, gets a little bit of muscle soreness, it was a bit of extra fatigue in there because of what we did in the first session, then it's probably not a good idea. But I can't make that decision for them because I'm not there with them and I can't feel what they can feel. So they need to make that decision. So I need to coach them what that, what that better judgment could be and the type of options that they have in front of them. So when I say being cautious, it's about choosing the most cautious option. So in a week's time, when they come back and I ask them, right, how did that all feel? Oh, it was absolutely fine. We've got some, some, some objective evidence to say that what we've done doesn't create any problems for your lower back. What we can then do is make a, a, a relatively um, calculated judgment to say, well, if it can cope with that over the period of a week and it's not a problem, let's try and progress it a little bit and see if we can push it on a little bit. And then there might be a point, two, three, four, five, six weeks down the line where their body starts responding and going, oh, this is getting a bit much now. So what we need to be able to do is rein that back a little bit and then progress it again. And instead of trying to avoid the problem, we try and work through the problem. So 
when I talk about being cautious, certainly being cautious at the start because we don't have the objective evidence of this works because it keeps me pain free. Once we've got that, we can then start, which is number three, we can then start pushing the boundaries a little bit and start being a little bit more, let's just say, optimistic because we've potentially got a greater margin for error. So if we are building strength or if we are building resilience of the core or building better spine health, there needs to be an element of you know, progression to it. So what we need to be able to do is have that understanding of their lower back pain and how it responds to be able to move them forward. If we've got evidence in the past that this has worked, that's worked, and the next has worked, we can sort of um, cautiously assume that what we choose next is gonna work if we follow the same pattern. If we just go and throw a load more exercises that we aren't familiar with on the top of it, then we're potentially gonna have a problem. But what we have to do is sort of progress them on and get them doing new things because they're gonna need to lift things, carry things, pull things, push things, bend over, bend forward in everyday life. So we've got to get them doing that. And if they feel uncomfortable doing it, we've got to do it at the right time, which is why we need to be cautious first, build the evidence, build the margin of error. Once we've built that evidence and a margin of error, and we can sort of reasonably say that this shouldn't be too much of a problem, we can then start implementing it. So when we are talking about advice for overcoming lower back pain, it's not, right, this exercise, it's that exercise, and it's that stretch, and it's that movement, and you need to lift in this way. It's not that. It's that building of the knowledge, building of the education, and building of the mindset of how to maintain a healthy spine and keep yourself pain-free, which is using your better judgment, which is being cautious, certainly to start with, and then cautiously progressing and just pushing the boundaries by doing slightly more uncomfortable things, but with the knowledge that we've got that objective evidence in the past that all this stuff's worked in the past, therefore we can assume that it's, there's gonna be a good chance of it working in the future. But that again is not to say that we still need to keep a tab on using the better judgment and how your, your back is feeling. So those are the six questions. Hopefully they've given you a better insight into how to overcome lower back pain. Hopefully uh, you've built your knowledge, you've gained a little bit of education. If you want to get in touch, um, either leave a comment below or come through to the website um, and you'll be able to, I'll put some links below to, to courses and coaching and things like that. So if you want help with that, then by all means, um, you can get in touch. So many thanks for watching. My name is Chris from Christopher Training. I'll speak to you in the next video.